seated. Open up to Romans 12. Tonight we're going to wrap up Romans 12, and since we're going to finish it up, we'll get a, a kind of a, just a quick review, run through and review what we've gone so far, starting in verse 1. So I'll give you the verse, you tell me what the basic, if you had to boil it down to a sentence or two, what's, what is our lesson from the verse? Let's start with verse 1. What is the basic practical application of verse 1 of Romans 12? Living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Make your body. And it, that, that is a pivotal point of Romans 12.1. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies... Okay, and when he says bodies, he's talking about the blood and flesh and bone and hair. The, what you are, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Make them available. Put them at the disposal of God. How about verse 2? Be set apart in your life from the world. Be set apart from the world. Don't let the world push you into its mold. Rather, be made into the image of Christ. Verses 3, 4, and 5, they all kind of go together. I'll let you take a second. You can read over them or glance through them real quick. How, how far do you, how far do you, or how tightly do you ascribe to that? We're told several times in Scripture not to be as the world, but there are some people that look, at the world as, as not accepting some medications from a doctor, not accepting blood. Uh, some people say that the coffee, the caffeine in coffee is... Jehovah's uh, Witness and yeah. Mormons, yeah. I mean, there's different people that believe hold to that. Yeah. And uh, I know that we're taught or told that if someone feels that it's wrong and uh, or believes that it's wrong that we're kind of to take that into consideration and how we live with them mm -hmm. in among them yeah. not to make fun of them because we don't believe like they do that would be in reference to believers not to okay. that, that's not I, I would counsel the fact that, a, that a, a Mormon doesn't drink caffeine if I was standing with a more, if I had a Mormon behind me at McDonald's, I'd still order coffee, because I my concern is not that I don't offend a Mormon's conscience, because a Mormon is not a believer. Okay. But so, uh, so that that would be Christian liberty. But I would say that you you should be as as strict as led by the Spirit of God. Okay. You know, there's the the Amish yeah. might take this verse and say, well, we're not being conformed to the world. Well, but but we do live in the world, and you know, you could you could take this, and truth is rarely found in the extremes. You say, well, the world wears pants. Well, you should too, because that's <laughs> culturally acceptable. It's part. Of, you could say, well, I'm I'm not being conformed to the world. No, no, you're. But you're also right. not going to be able to be usable. So you don't want to be somebody who's a social liability because of your difference. In, in needless okay. things. But good good question. Verses 3, 4, and 5. All They kind of, the three of them go together. <laughs> we all have our, our gifts and we need to use them. Yeah, yeah. Practice humility. Humility. Gifts is... The, the, the humility and the gifts very much run together because what is our tendency with gifts? Our, our tendency is to forget that they're gifts, right? And we feel like, well, I'm just, I'm just special. No, you're, you, there are some gifted people, but it should be in the, they sh that should be interpreted in light of the fact God has given that person that ability. And for them to be proud of that, is not good, which verses 6, 7, and 8 are the spiritual gifts. I'll give you the, the gift. You tell me what it means exactly. There's the gift of prophecy. What is it today? We don't have one. Well, I would, I would, I would 
contradict you there. Prophecy in the in the Bible times would have been foretelling, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the ability to see the future. Sure. Now we would refer to prophecy as foretelling. It's speaking forth the truth of God. That is what the prophets did. Much of the ministry of the prophets was actually not having to do with the future. It had to do with the present. When, when Jeremiah stood up before the king and he said, you need to do this now, he was speaking God's truth. So prophecy would be foretelling. How about the gift of ministry, the spiritual gift of ministry? Service, yeah, helps. Teaching. Just exactly that. <laughs> just, just exactly that, yeah. The ability to take perhaps difficult to understand truths, make them simplistic. Exhortation. Encouraging. Encouraging. Edification. Building one another up. Giving is pretty straightforward. The gift of of allowing yourself to be used as a conduit of God's blessing. God can give something to you knowing that you'll pass it to those who need more. Ruling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the ability to have authority, right? The spiritual gift of ruling would be, uh, many people have, have kind of given kind of a synonym, would be administration. The ability to make everybody work well together, to, to systematize, to get everything going in the right direction. And then mercy, again, the gift is kind of self-explanatory. Someone who comes alongside and encourages others. How about verse 9? Verse 9, what's the practical application? Discern what's good, what's bad, what's wrong. Yep. Hate evil, love righteousness, and the, the first part of verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. Be genuine. Be a genuine Christian. Verse 10 kind of piggybacks off of that. What's verse 10? Love one another. Love one another. Specifically, who's who am I specifically to love? Because they're believers. Believers with brotherly love. So I am to love I'm to love all men. But I'm especially to love other believers. And that will dictate uh, my behavior. Verse 11. Days work for a day's pay. Don't be lazy. God's given you something to do. Do it. Do it well. Apply yourself. Instead of being lazy, be busy serving the Lord in everything. How about verse 12? the Lord will help you through that situation. Yeah. That's while good. At, while you're at it, stay in prayer. Yeah. Whether it's good or bad. Yes. <laughs> Constant communication. This was, verse 12 is where, where I, I gave the, as an illustration, there's extreme training for some of the more elite units in any military. That extreme training is not in the business of killing recruits. It's in the business of making elite soldiers. Okay? Why does God allow you to go through intense trials? To, to grow you and to mature you. And prayer is essential. Stay in constant communication. Verse 13. <clears throat> Help me 
meet your brothers and sisters' needs? Yeah. <clears throat> Give to the necessity of others. Practice genuine hospitality. Verse 14. Verse 14. This is going to tie in real close with what we look at a little bit later today. Don't retaliate against people, is how I'd say it. Don't yeah. Retaliate against them. That's quite the word of the Lord. That's good. Yeah. Don't don't respond when you're being mistreated. We we have a tendency to want to pray down the fire of God. We would do better to pray for blessing. For them instead. Verse 15. Read the room. Read the room. <laughs> don't, be the, don't be the one who's laughing when everybody's crying. Don't be the one who's crying when everyone's laughing. <clears throat> Allow some, be, be someone who can genuinely join in the emotions of others. When they're crying, be a comfort. When they're rejoicing, cheer them on. Verse 16. Don't be arrogant. That's good. Don't allow superior knowledge to make you arrogant. We tend to do that, don't we? We always, all, all men in all times and at all ages, right? You, you ever seen a little kid who has knowledge that the other kids don't have? <laughs> it, it, it tends to puff them up, and it tends to puff up adults too. Don't allow that to happen. Verse 17. This was last week. Verse 17. <clears throat> Pay back evil with good, right? Don't don't pay. We use the uh, one of the commentators that I, I gave you last week said don't don't pay back in the same coin. If you're dealt with evil, don't pay back in evil. Pay back in in righteousness. And in verse eighteen. Don't be an agitator. Perfect. Yes. Don't be an agitator. When fights come, and they will, make sure they're not because you were looking for them. Okay? As much as is possible, live at peace with all men. Okay? Don't go out looking for a fight because you'll find one. Okay? And the, the trouble with looking for fights is you, you can never really control who's going to take you up on it. And it might be somebody who's better equipped than you are. So when somebody does you wrongly, which is what we're talking about in verse 18... When, when you're in the midst of difficulty, when somebody does you wrongly, we come to verse 19, and we're told, by way of practical application, that we should leave vengeance to God. Look at verse 19. Dearly beloved, who's he talking to? Christians. Christians. That should inform us here. He, the whole chapter is talking to Christians. Okay, But this especially, he, he reminds us, beloved. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. When it says avenge not yourselves, the word avenge, uh, some, some synonyms, part of the definition for that would be to vindicate. Don't seek to vindicate yourself. Don't retaliate. Don't punish the other person. When somebody has done you wrong and you have it within your ability to give it back to them, don't. Don't. Stop. Though it may be within your power, God has a better way. And God has a much more effective way. And we'll deal with, in just a moment, the problem that we have with this verse is that we want a hand in the vengeance. Because we were the one who was done wrong, 
and it hurt our feelings, and we want to have at least a little bit of the, the satisfaction that comes when we see that person suffer for what they did to us. And so we'll deal with that in just a second here. But he says, rather than avenge yourself, right in the middle of the verse, but rather give place unto wrath. Now, at first glance, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us as, as we would understand it, perhaps. In, in the Greek, wrath is preceded by a definite article, the definite article, the, which would, which would translate it to read, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto the wrath. The wrath. Who, who would have the wrath? that would be referenced to a group of believers that we are supposed to give place to. The Bible says, Be ye angry and sin not. Okay, It says, Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So what wrath can I give place to? God, I guess. God's. The wrath belongs to God. My wrath? The Bible also says that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. When, when you're angry, how many good decisions can you look back on that you made when you were angry? Can you look back and, and point out some dumb decisions that you made when you were angry? You know, you, you kicked that thing. Or I, I had, I've had guys when I was in college, I could take you to holes in the wall. That, uh, why did you do that? Well, I was angry. Well, that wasn't real sharp, was it? You put a hole in the wall. You shouldn't have done that. Okay? Lots of bad things happen when I'm angry. That's why God says, look, you don't need to get angry. You give place to the wrath. You give place to God's wrath. When you punch a hole in the wall, you take a chance of hitting the stick. It does. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, I've met some guys. It, you don't have to be just real tough to punch a hole in drywall, but you've got to be a man to punch a hole in the stick. Right? That, that doesn't happen a whole lot. He says, we give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Whenever I read that, my first question is, well, where is it written? And it's written in Deuteronomy 32, 35. God, in the law, says, vengeance is mine and recompense. In the time when their foot shall slide, for the day of their disaster is at hand, and their doom comes speedily. It's also written in Hebrews 10, 30, where we read, for we know that we for we know him that hath said, Vengeance vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 31 of Hebrews 10 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Vengeance. The word means vindication. It means retribution or punishment. When you look up when he says, Avenge not yourselves, earlier in the verse. That is a verb, avenge not, don't do that. This is the noun form. This is where he says, look, vindication, retribution, punishment belongs not to me, it belongs to God. Now, from a purely pragmatic view, when you're treated poorly or you're done wrong, who could more effectively dish out punishment, you or God? God could probably dish out more appropriate punishment. Well, he could do, or, or more devastating punishment. God yeah. sent ten plagues on Egypt and brought the world's superpower to its knees. Okay. What could God do on your behalf? Anything. Anything he wants because he's God. And the, the good thing about when you put vengeance in the hands of God is he won't do wrong. If, if I try to take vengeance into my own hands, my flesh gets involved because I'm mad. And so I might dish out wrongly, <laughs> take the might out. I will take vengeance wrongly. Obviously, our, our hang-up with this is that we want to have a hand in the process, right? When, when I've been done wrong, I don't want to hand it to God. I want to fight my own battles. I, there's, there's some... 
something about us as, as humans that makes us want to have a part in the process when we were done wrong. But if we're patient and we place vengeance in the hands of God where it rightfully belongs, then we will ultimately see God make all things right. And, and we will not be taken down along with them. You, maybe you've heard the phrase, when you go out for revenge, you better dig two graves. One for the person you're after, one for yourself. Because a lot of people set out for revenge and they end up messing themselves up as a result. I think something that comes into play there, I'm sure it does, is sometimes if you try to avenge yourself, uh, the powers that be see what you did and not what the other person did. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> How many times have you caught the second kid who hit, not the first? Mm -hmm. Usually, probably. Yeah. I, I can think of many times when we as children, I have a number of brothers and, and sisters, and sometimes when we got into it, if we really got into it, my father didn't do a, a whole lot of day-to-day -day correcting, but mother did. And she would say, I'll take care of it. Well, I'm sure she did. But like you said, if I could just get one punch, punch in before she came yeah. around, I'd yeah. feel a lot better about it. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it is part of who we are. As, as people, we want to have a hand in it. And I think probably in the back of our minds, we also have the thought, well, what if God doesn't? What if God doesn't give vengeance to that one? What, you know, they, they did me wrong. And I'm going to put, I'm going to say, you know what, Lord? I'm giving the vengeance to you because it belongs to you. You deal with them. God gives us a promise here in this verse. In verse 19, he says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. That, that's, a, that's a promise that you can take it to the bank. God says he'll do it. Well, God decides you have to come. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it's interesting that you say that. If you read the book of Habakkuk, that's one of those books that we don't often turn to for a blessing, but it does have some tremendous blessing in it. The whole book is, God tells Habakkuk, he says, look, I'm going to use the Assyrians to punish Israel. And Habakkuk says, Lord, you can't be serious. Assyria? As bad as we are, they're so much worse. How can you use Assyria? And God says, Assyria will get what's coming as well, but I'm going to use them. Can God use someone else's mistreatment of me? to bring about correction in my life. Absolutely he can. Which, it, which just kind of gives more reason for me to put vengeance in the hands of God rather than for me to strike out against what God was using to do some correcting in my life too. God will write. God will settle all the scores. When, when all is said and all is done, all the vengeance will have been taken and everyone will be put in their place. There won't be anybody who gets away with it. You know, we, we have these, uh, these people, we say, well, they're going to get away. You know, they'll die and they'll never see justice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can bet they'll see justice just right after they die because that's the way it works. Nobody, nobody's going to get out of it. Nobody's going to skirt responsibility for their actions forever. There will be a day of reckoning. The Bible says it's appointed unto man wants to die. And after this, judgment. Some people get their judgment here on earth. Some people will get their judgment a little bit later. But when I place my, my vindication, my retribution, my revenge in the hands of God, it frees me up to obey verse 20. Verse 20 says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. What exactly is that talking about, heaping coals of fire on the head? Well, we'll deal with that in just a second. But rather than recompensing evil for evil, verse 17, I'm to meet the apparent needs of those who are hostile to me. That's hard, isn't it? 
When, when you have, and I, I understand that you, you say, well, I don't have any real enemies. You know, I got some people I don't like, but I don't consider them to be my enemy. I mean, I, if their house was burning down, I'd go knock on their door and tell them their house was on fire. It's not that. I just don't like them. Well, those are the people. You, know, you say there's, there's tension, there's hostility between me and this person for whatever reason, and I don't know what the reason is. But there's hostility there. God says, you, you meet their needs. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them drink. Now, there are, in so doing that, he says, we will heap coals of fire on their head. I have heard several messages on this, and there are several interpretations of this. I'll give, I'll give you both of them, and I'll tell you which one I kind of ascribe to, but you can take your pick. In this day, in the Oriental culture in which the Bible was written, the, the Eastern culture, they would often seek help from their neighbor if their fire went out. Fire was something that they used in day-to-day -day life. They had to have their fire burned from morning till night and burned all night. And so if their fire went out... It, it was a laborious process to get it started. So many times they would go to a neighbor and they would ask them for coals from their hearth. And according to some commentators, they would put them into a, 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 an urn of some sort and then they would carry it home on their head. And so some would say that that's what this verse is talking about. In, when you do, when you give right and you do good to those who are doing you evil, it's, it's doing this. It's, it's giving them what they need to, to continue on doing their life. To be perfectly honest, that seems like a little bit of a stretch to me. Okay, That application, well, it it's, has to do with the oriental culture of people putting fire on their heads. It doesn't feel genuine to me. Another commentator, whose name is Denny, gives this other, and I think probably more likely, interpretation. He says, quote, The meaning of heaping burning coals on his head is hardly open to doubt. It must refer to the burning pain of shame and remorse, which the man feels whose hostility is repaid by love. This is the only kind of vengeance the Christian is at liberty to contemplate. To, to put it in words that we use a little bit more, you ever heard the phrase, kill them with kindness? That's the idea. I'm going to, when they're mean to me, when they do wrong, when they're hostile towards me, I'm going to just do right. I'm going to continue doing right, and, and it will eat them up. And I've, I've seen it happen enough times to know it does eat them up. When, when you return goodness for evil, the person won't know how to respond. As a matter of fact, a lot of times they think that you're, you're, you're setting them up, but you're, but you're not. You're genuinely, again, let love be without hypocrisy from earlier. I'm to genuinely seek their good, my enemy. Matthew 5 verse 38 says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is Jesus talking. But I say unto you that... That ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn thou not away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. My obedience to verse 19 and verse 20 will automatically bring about my obedience to verse 21, which kind of wraps up this whole section where he says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. When it says overcome, it has the idea of winning a legal case. D don't, don't try to, to win over evil with more evil. Win over evil 
with good, with the righteousness of Christ, with the fruit of the Spirit, with loving your enemy, and in so doing, you heap coals of fire on his head, they'll be miserable. Miserable not because you're doing them wrong, not because you're behaving spitefully, but because you're doing them good. And they won't know how to take it. And it, think of how countercultural that has always been. It's that goes against our culture now. Right now, our culture says if somebody if somebody gets you, you get them back. The, the idea of the, if they hit you, hit back twice as hard. But, but God says, do good. Overcome evil with good. The, you said something a little bit ago that, that <clears throat> is key. I, we all know it's key because if you don't do it with the right attitude... You're, you know, if you do it with the attitude of saying, well, I'm going to be so nice to him, I'm going to make him miserable. Well, that's not the attitude that... Yeah. I don't think that's the attitude that Christ is talking about. Yeah. Let love, when it says, let love be without hypocrisy, if I, if Andy does me wrong, and I say, I'm going to be so nice to him, it gives him a stroke. Yeah. Is that, is that true love? No, but what I do is... How do we do that? Well, only through the power of the Spirit of God can we possibly do that. Because it's not in man to love his enemy. But it is in a child of God when we think that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he looked down on the people who had just driven nails into his hands and feet and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that's the, the love that needs to come out of me that will enable all of this behavior. It'll enable me. My, my goal is not to make them miserable. It will. But that's not my goal. What is the ultimate goal? Win them to Christ. Win them to Christ. Wouldn't it be great if the person who was openly hostile to you, you know, in a few years, they're sitting here in church singing hymns with you? That, that would be the ideal situation. And then you can have, then you can have fellowship. Then you can say, you know, we had some rough times, didn't we? But I love you in the Lord now. And we can love that person. We, we lovingly lead them in the direction of Christ by doing good, by repaying good for evil. Is it uh, the Proverbs? Or what would it be the, the verse about returning like the angry word, the soft words to get a, a soft response? Soft, a soft answer turneth away breath. you think that? I yeah. can't think. Yeah. Seems like it might be Proverbs. It is. That's that is Proverbs. But the interesting thing about this whole heap and coals, that's in Proverbs twenty five twenty two, the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. So did the writer of Romans actually take that from Proverbs? I mean, did Proverbs exist before that? He he, he would have had access to it, so very likely would have had some connection to it. Yeah. So absolutely. The idea of doing good when you're done wrong to do good in return, th the point is not to kill the person with kindness, <laughs> literally. The, the point is to win the person to Christ, to bring that person to the end of themselves. In verse 21, when we read overcome, the tense of that is uh, continuing action. So it would be stop being overcome of evil but be overcoming evil with good. This is, this is a never-ending process. As long as you're drawing air on this side of the side, you will have occasion to return good for evil. That's just the way it is. But practically speaking, I like what one commentator said. He said, if my bad temper puts you in a bad temper, you have been overcome of evil. Right? Right? If, if my bad temper puts you in a bad temper, you've been overcome with evil. And I'm not to overcome evil with evil. You think I can out-bad temper you? You think I could have a bigger blow-up than you? Who, who knows? You know, I hope we never find out because I shouldn't be doing that. I have, I have little to say about what others do to me. But I have everything to say about how I react to them. There was a, a Christian camp down in North Carolina years ago that would, all of their counselors who had to deal with all of the kids all summer 
They made them read a little book. I had a copy of it. I don't know what happened to it, but it was called Your Reactions Are Showing. Because why? Because when you deal with people, and we all do on, in some respect, when you deal with people, sometimes you'll be done wrong. And you don't have anything to say about what they do to you. But you do have everything to say about what you do back. Your response should, should be Christ-like. Because you have Christ inside. If, if I took an orange and I squeezed it, what would come out? What kind, of, what kind of juice? If I squeeze it just right, can I get apple juice? <laughs> yeah. that doesn't work. Why? Because there's no apple juice in an orange. If, so so when, when my excuse is, well, that wasn't really me, I was just stressed. It means that what was when I get squeezed, what comes out of me is what is in me, right? And, and when you squeeze a Christian, what should come out? Christ. Christ-like reactions. Christ-like responses. Christ's love. Christ's long-suffering. Christ's grace. Christ's mercy is what should come out of me. And, and when it doesn't, when, when you squeeze me just right and my temper flares and I get mad and I blow up, that, that's part of me that is conformed to the world, not transformed by the renewing of my mind. But in, today, <coughs> in today's world, I don't, you know, I, I, I realize that we're told to do this, but so many times people that wrong us are so many miles away we may never ever hear from them again. We probably never see them. We wouldn't recognize them. So it's probably a little bit easier to go against that command. Because back then, they had more, I think, face time to each other. A lot, lot smaller circle of influence. Yes, yeah. for sure. Some of them, certainly. I mean, Paul, Paul traveled... More, more widely than most of us will in our lifetime, and yet he's the one who wrote this under the inspiration of Scripture. So, what, what is in me will come out in these situations. When evil is done to me, if, if I am walking with God, if I'm walking close, if I'm being led by the Spirit, if I'm doing, if I'm doing verses 1 through 18... Then verses 19, 20, and 21 will happen. If I'm practically living Christianity, then the reactions will be natural because what is inside of me will be what it should be. That's how it is. That's how it should be for us anyway. So the lesson this evening, depend on the, on the fact that God is watching and keeping the final score. You and I... Don't need to worry about when others seem to be getting away with it. They're not get, they might be outside of what I can do, but God's keeping the score. And then serve God and love and serve others, even the unlovely, especially the unlovely, because that's a truly Christian trait. Even, even the lost love those who love them back, but it's a truly Christian trait to love and serve the unlovely. So take, take some time. Go over Romans 12 again. I would encourage you to. And solidify the practical lessons that are found here for us. Any, any closing thoughts from Romans 12? As, as we went over these gifts in the, in the verses, there's very few of them gifts that I think there's very few of them gifts that don't need magnified by either by structuring our lives around them or, or educating ourselves to that gift. Sure. Uh, you know, Mel plays the piano and the organ and I don't know what else, but sh sh she didn't, she wasn't born with that. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's not enough if, if you have a preacher who says, I have the gift of teaching, so I don't need to study. That's not smart, okay? No, if you have a calling, then you also, a calling to serve is a calling to prepare. If, if you have the, the gift of giving, then you need to actively be looking for opportunities to give. If you, have the, if you have the gift of exhortation, then you're actively looking. How can, when you come on Sunday, you're looking around and you say, who, who can I be a blessing to? You're looking for the person with the long face. You're looking for the person who, who has a tear in their eye. And you, you go up to them and you, you say, hey, you know, I'm praying for I just want to, you're trying to encourage, and yet you structure your life around what God has called you to and what God has gifted you to do. Because a gifting is, is the direction that you go, but yeah, you, you work to perfect it. You work to, to practice it on a regular basis. It's very good. Very good. Any other thoughts? Sometime we'll do a study on spiritual gifts in their entirety. We did a, a week on them here, but like I mentioned, they're found in two other places. They're found in 1 Corinthians, they're found in Ephesians, and they're found here in Romans. And as I said, every person who has trusted Christ as their personal Savior has at least one, and most have two, three, four, five gifts. So everybody who is a believer has at least one gift, for the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so that's that's something that we'll we'll spend some time and we'll go over that sometime. What if you what if you don't know about the gifts? <clears throat> you don't recognize the gifts. Well it just, ask it, somebody else. Typically, okay. yeah. It does help to ask somebody else. Yeah. A lot of times somebody else could could help you to see your gift. If, if, you ever, if you ever fancy yourself to have achieved sinless perfection, you can ask your spouse, right? And say, what areas do I need to work on? And they will surely be able to help you. Anybody, right? If you go up to somebody who knows you well, you say, hey, I, I feel perfect. What do I need to work on? They'll laugh at you, and they'll say, pride is one of them. And then, they'll, then they'll, they can list out the things that you need to work on. But also, the other side of that same coin is say. I want to be used of God. What what would you say my gifting is? Don't, don't you think God gives you an opportunity for your gift? I mean, he's, he's probably showed you if you yep. pay attention. But you have to have your eyes open yeah. for it. Could you have the gift of exhortation and not encourage? You could, you could but it'd be a waste. Because, because that means that somebody who God wanted you to encourage is now going without the encouragement that God would have them to have if you would wake up. If I would wake up and I would exercise my gift, then that person will be, will be cared for as they should be. 